your next deployment to Iraq and yeah. all the vehicle interdiction stuff you're doing. Let's go into some of that. Yeah, so came back from Q course. Um, the next rotation over was a different one. So the you know, things had kind of evolved. We weren't doing 24-hour ops anymore. We were running day-night out of different outstations around the country. Um, but uh, a couple weeks into that rotation, uh, we decided we were going to stand up a, a daylight vehicle interdiction cell. So we were going to use helicopters um, and intelligence collection to target individuals. Uh, and when they left structures or houses, wherever they were, and they were mobile, um, we could hit them in the right spot at the right time. Uh, you know, minimizing external threat and, and c civilians and everything else um, and maximizing our ability to get exactly who we were after. So at this point in the war, you know, intelligence collection was fantastic. Like we had a lot of air assets. We had a lot of um, drones and things that were providing real time information and visual stuff that we could see. Um, so we would build target packets on folks. We would watch guys. We pattern a life them. Uh, and basically we were pre-staged at Balad. Uh, and when they got into a certain area where we felt like we could go get them, we'd load up on the helos and we'd go get them. Um, my team was a completely new batch of folks at this point. Um, so I was a 2IC roughly at the time. Uh, and basically we had a bunch of fresh guys out of OTC. Uh, weird thing about the unit, it doesn't mean they were all young guys. Um, some guys don't end up over there till way late in their career. Uh, some guys end up there early like I did, you know, earlier in their career. Um, so it was kind of a mixed bag, but they were new to the unit and, and had never been overseas with us. Um, we were really good at what we were doing. Um, so we were aggressively targeting uh, foreign fighters, terrorists, and folks that were a part of the network. Um, and we did so. And these are, these are key players. Yeah, all of them. It's not your everyday fucking ground fighter. It's not, you know, we're going to set an idea up and then go to a party. These are, these are key players that you guys are going after, yeah, and key, a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah, a lot of them. Um, it led to a lot of very successful uh, mission sets where you knew exactly who you were after. You were watching that individual. You watched them get into a vehicle, uh, and then you flew up alongside them and, and confirmed that, hey, there's nobody but exactly who we think it is in that vehicle. Uh, they're all military age males. They're all our primary targets, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna deal with that threat. Um, so very successful. You know, we had some funny ones in there just to lighten it up after that like heavy last segment. Yeah. You know, one time uh, I think it's my one and only hostage rescue. Although a number of them have been done over the years by by the Navy guys and and by us. Uh, one in particular during this daylight vehicle interdiction phase is we were watching a couple of bad guys and. They had left the structure they were in, and they weren't. They hadn't quite broken the box of where we needed them to be to launch yet. Um, but while they were en route to that location, they stopped off at a gas station. We watched. It was a car full of four dudes. We watched them get out of the vehicle. They went up to a semi truck, and they basically carjacked the semi truck. So they took the two Iraqis out of the semi truck, the, the driver, driver and passenger. They stuffed them in the back of the trunk of the car. Two guys got in the car, the other two guys got in the semi-truck. Semi-truck went one way, the car went the other, and we went, well, guess we're doing a hostage rescue for a couple of Iraqis. Um, so literally within nine minutes of these two shitheads kidnapping two random Iraqis and stealing their truck, uh, we had stopped the vehicle, killed those two, and I popped the trunk and let the two Iraqis out. And I thought, man, no wonder, no wonder they think. What did you say to them? <laughs> no, I, I don't think I said anything. There was a couple of us, you know. Hey, guys. Yeah, it was like, come on, come on. And they were freaked out like they had no idea. Like they got carjacked at gunpoint, got stuffed in a trunk, probably thought they were going to die the next time the trunk opened and opened the trunk and there's two Americans fully kitted out, standing there over top of them, helping them out. And I thought, man, no wonder the bad guys think we are the greatest nation in the world. Like, they just did this, and nine, ten minutes later, we were on them. Yeah. Uh, and so that was a, a kind of a neat point. Um, but, yeah, there was a lot of good things that happened in that stretch, a lot of bad guys taken off the map. Um, it was a bit cathartic in that. I, that was kind of the anger phase um, for me. You know, I was really upset about things that had happened in 05 and guys that we had lost. I mean, um, before we get into that, it sounds like you guys have just killed an entire deck of cards. Yeah, easy. Do you get numb to that? I mean, do you, 
do you even fucking care anymore that I mean uh, these are all key players or does it just is it just going to work I think it depends you know some guys get more involved in the intelligence picture and exactly who and what and why we're doing what we're doing um, I think I got a little more numb as the years went by uh, I think there's an evolution in empathy that occurs in combat that people don't talk about very often um, it doesn't mean that you're making bad decisions it means that the decision matrix or the amount of time that it takes you to get to that decision to pull the trigger gets less um, some of it's <laughs> and I've said it before, like Spidey Sense, where you just know this is bad and your your reaction times get quicker or you feel like something's about to go bad or whatever. Um, but some of it's just, yeah, it's just a reduction in empathy. So, no, for me, I didn't... They were just bad guys. You know, they were guys that were going to kill me if I didn't kill them. Um, and I felt the same about my teammates and all the things that they were doing. Uh, so, yeah... You know, like I said before, like we're the good guys, and I always felt like we conducted ourselves as such. You know, whether you're on a target and and you just, you know, put some rounds in a guy, and then you you picked up his young child and gave it back to the mother, um, to in some effort of consoling the trauma that they just went through. You know, they don't know any better, but but yeah, I think I think you do over time get a little cold and lose a little, a little bit of empathy as time goes by, and I think that kind of happens to everybody. Yeah. We can move on. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so that rotation, yeah. Uh, that, was, that was probably one of our better rotations in that it was one of the healthiest cycles we ever had while we were there. You know, we were staged in, in Balad. We were getting up. We were working out. We were eating three squares a day. We weren't doing night ops. It was all daylight stuff. It was all daylight? All daylight. Wow, and it was effective, and it you know it hadn't been done. Nobody done a daylight vehicle helo born interdiction since the, like the one that they did in Somalia in '93, um, chasing Muhammad Farid Adid, you know, and or whatever the guy's name was, Otto or whoever they rolled up uh, doing one. But um, but yeah, it hadn't been done in a long time. It was really really effective, not just for that rotation, but it was effect- effective for the rotation after us. The guys continued to do it for another sixty days, so we literally like cleaned the board. Um, in terms of, you know, bad guys and influencers on the battlefield, you know, high value targets, like we really cleaned house in a, in about a 90 day period. Um, for us, you know, like I told you, the fun one was the hostage rescue, but sort of towards the tail end, we had one where it was some guys that we were tracking related to, to AMZ, Abu Musab al Zarqawi, um, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, one of the few objective names I remember, it was like Objective Mayor, but it was a daylight vehicle interdiction that turned into a full-blown daylight helo assault. Um, and so whether they had gotten used to our pattern and activity and what we were doing to engage them, or it was just pure dumb luck, they broke off of the road that we were intending to interdict them on um, and ended up pulling up to a house in a rural community, a couple of structures together. Um, and they got out and went in the house. Well, they were fairly significant, high-value individuals, so our daylight vehicle interdiction turned into a daylight assault. So we changed course, started heading towards the, the objective. Uh, about one minute out, um, I was, as they say, I was like the lead nav guy, as the two I see on the team. Uh, my particular team was responsible for navigation to the target, uh, whether it was a vehicle or whether it was a house or whether we were walking or whatever it was. So. I was in the door of the helo. Uh, I had a, a tough book next to me, a laptop, you know, running some map software, tracking our location, and had the target house pinned on there. And then we had a predator overhead, so we had a display in the helo also with what the pred was seeing. So I'm watching this, looking out the window, watching this, looking out the window, looking where the target house is, and the pilot flies right by the house. And it's out in the middle of a farm field. So I'm screaming and I'm slapping the crew chief and I'm pointing it's right there it's right there it's right there well the pilots you know the crew chief says something to the pilot pilot banks hard comes back down sets down in the field and the trail bird comes in sets down behind us well there's a uh, there's a um, irrigation ditch like a great big irrigation ditch between us and the target house and as we got out and started moving we all like collectively like the I don't know it was two and a half teams worth of guys two teams worth of guys hit this ditch and we're all just standing there because we know it's like chest deep and nobody wants to cross this thing (laughs) (laughs) 
And like a, like a scene out of a World War II movie, our troop commander at the time goes, Get over there! <laughs> 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 and I remember laughing because there's a bunch of commandos, you know, afraid to cross this little body of water. But we did, and uh, we crested the other side of the of the trench line. And then luckily for us, um, the guys just sort of starburst out of the house. And so there was a lot more than we thought. It was eight to ten guys, and they came out guns blazing. So as we're trying to close the distance and deal with some of them, the, the two little birds that we had in support had caught up to us because the hawks were a lot faster than the little birds. So when it turned into a... A Hilo assault. We didn't want to waste any time. We wanted to get them while they were fresh in case they were spooked and trying to go arm themselves, which is what they did. But uh, so as they squirted out, the little birds came in. And so there's this weird daylight thing where we're firing, maneuvering across this field towards the house as these guys go in every direction. The little birds came in with guys on the pods and they're shooting down and the bad guys are shooting up. One of the pilots took one through his foot, straight through his foot, didn't tell anybody, finished the whole operation. It wasn't until we got back we found out he had a bullet hole right through the bottom of his boot. Just kept flying the mission. Uh, we had another guy take one into his weapon, uh, so didn't penetrate his rifle, but hit him right in the rifle Damn. on the pod. Uh, but so anyway, target goes down. You know, We're all good. Everybody's okay, minus the wounded pilot. Uh, and the bad guys are all dead, but every single one of those guys had a body bomb on. Every one of them. All of them. Every single one um, was wearing a rigged body bomb. None of them detonated. The two vehicles that were in basically the front yard where they had parked the car were like two of those like minibuses, both of them fully loaded with explosives. They were VBIDs that were, they were getting ready to use. Uh, and the realization hit us that when we flared and turned, when we missed the target and came back in, if they would have just happened to be able to clack off one of those two trucks, it would have taken down both helos and probably killed everybody in our troop. Shit. Um, but fortunately for us, and this is the way war goes, what is it, what's the saying? Better to be lucky than good or whatever? Yeah. We were lucky that day. And um, yeah, the intel that came off of that uh, in particular was, was some of the intel that was utilized to target AMZ, which we had rotated out, but the very next rotation is when they, they dropped all those bombs and killed him uh, and confirmed that he was killed. So, yeah, it was a really successful rotation. Mentally, it was probably good because we were really getting after it, and, you know, we all had a lot of baggage from 05. Um, so, you know, we were really effective. We were really engaged, and, uh, and yeah, it was, and we didn't lose anybody. So it was a good trip. Man, you've been a part of a lot of high-profile stuff. Yeah, weird, lucky timing. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how it all plays out, but you look back on it and you go, wow, I, was, I got to do some significant things that not a lot of, not a, a lot of guys got to do. And I, to this day, I, you know, now I can look back and realize how fortunate I was, not just to live through all that, but to experience all that and to yeah. do it with the guys that I did. So 